So, true story, true story, Queensbury High School in upstate New York, which is where I went to high school, you will not find it on a map, trust me. We were, yes, wait for it, the Spartans. No kidding. So, I'm already a Spartan and now I'm just coming back to it, so it's like, it's like being back at home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having Thank me. You. I appreciate that a bunch. All right. Before we even get going, you get to start asking me questions right out the gate. What do I have to answer that will make this interesting for you in the next 45 minutes? Any question, it all counts. Please, just fire it out. <laughs> Why am I not wearing it right away? So being from upstate New York, I am constantly hot. So if I put that on, which I will happily do, you'll just have to deal with the fact that I'm going to start sweating within about two minutes. And I thought that didn't come across as very professional. So if you can, I can put it on and take it off just to prove the point, but that's the only reason. I could also do something like, and this is just such a bad look, but you, got, you, know, you could do it that way, right? That just looks totally classy. But that's seriously, that's the only reason. I run temperature hot all the time. And I'm already warm, so I would literally be melting if I was standing up here. Give me till about three hours from now when it gets cooler and the fog starts coming in in Venetia and I'll be wearing it tonight. I'll, prom I'll even send you a photo just to prove the point. <laughs> what other questions? Seriously. Sir. Oh, my, my, oh, it's okay. I think it's only for him. I'm not sure there's any actual yeah. speakers uh -huh. involved. So my question is, uh, what's the best way to grow and learn in this field? Best way to grow and learn in this field. Got it? Give me some other ones. Sir. How does someone who doesn't have the field in uh, computer science start in this field? How does somebody who doesn't actually study computer science start in this field? Okay, got it. We're going to hit on that one too. Sir. What do you look for when you're hiring people? Okay. What do I look for in hiring people? Um, give me a sense just of you guys, like seniors, juniors, sophomore, freshman, undergrad, grad. Walk me through this. Undergrad. Fre we got freshman to senior to, so we got all walks. So some of you are getting ready to either attempt to get a job, have already gotten a job, or are going to grad school. And then some of you are kind of going, I'm glad I've got a few more years to figure this all out so that I can figure out how to get a job. You know, go into another job, look for a job, or, or get into grad school. Okay, got it. So let me tell you a little bit about how I got from where you are to me and what I'm doing now um, and try and answer some of the questions that have already popped up um, in, uh, inclusive of how this job in this particular field is one of the most popular and most interesting and is going to be for a very long time. I can promise you something almost right out the gate, which is as you look um, a little bit into the future, even as looking at right now, there's one million jobs by all accounts that are open worldwide in some field of information, computer, cyber, network, system security that have nobody to fill them right as I stand here. One million. We are fighting to find an additional 20 people as I stand here right now, in just the information and security operations team alone. The demand for this particular set of areas of interest and, and passions is so high that it started and became more important quicker than the education system, the college, university systems even had degrees, far less had produced first generation students coming out of them. So you're in a particularly great spot. I know a great number of people who have got business management degrees that can't find a job. I know a whole series of people that are working in the arts that are struggling. I know a series of people that are even as recently, I was just talking to a colleague, a friend of mine this morning, who said his son is in a particular area of physics, can't find a job. And so this is not the area to worry about that. There are plenty of jobs available, and then it's a match between you and the place you want to work and you and the particular area of this field that you're gonna love the most. So keep on track with this as a field and you'll go from where you're sitting, you have, there's full on capability to where you're sitting right now, you could be an industry leader who mentors young people that come out of college, that would be my mentor and friend Michelle who brought me out of college 
And then she's now world renowned, both as an instructor as well as a leader in the information security field. And she has launched a whole series of people's careers, including my own. And despite all attempts for me to totally screw it up, and gosh knows I had a few, I'm now, as a, as, a, as a person who sort of grew up with not even realizing what was going to happen, I'm now a senior vice president in a Fortune 500 $50 billion company. It might make you think twice about working at Cisco if I'm the senior vice president and running inside of Cisco, but that's a different judgment you're going to have to come up on your own. Um, but that's the kind of thing that can happen with passion and interest in a field that is emerging right ahead of you. There was no computer security field of any type almost when I started. It was just at the very, very, very beginning. And, and Michelle was helping to define it, and then we all helped define it together. Now you're looking at the same situation. You're looking at an entire world that is connecting devices so quickly, is building software so fast, and frankly, is depending on those systems to work that there's a real heartbeat check which goes, oh my gosh, what if somebody breaks in from the inside, from the outside, a system fails, the software's designed wrong, it's got flaws, somebody exploits it. If it's a country to country, an individual, one of you decides to go rogue, break into other, you know, other companies, become a hacker, whatever it is, that's what the gulp factor is for every company that I know. And to give you a depth of just how important this is, in the last three years, more countries had published cybersecurity strategies for their country than in an entire prior 20 years. And that's a whole country. And then every company I've come up with and talked to is asking the question, where do you source talent? How are you hiring them? How do you retain them? And in most recent, in a most recent example where Cisco hosted a summit called the CEO Summit just two weeks ago in South Carolina on Kiowai Island, the heads of Fortune 50 businesses said, what's their number one worry? It was not the economy, even though they're paid as CEOs to worry about how to grow their businesses and the like. It was not opportunity. In other words, they didn't see, you know, they were lost on what they could do. It wasn't even reinventing themselves. It was, I am deathly afraid of a computer security breach that hurts. And to be honest with you, it used to be a discussion about, hey, my information is going to be taken. That's what we're reading about in the newspaper all the time. You know, credit card numbers are stolen, health records are stolen. And I say stolen kind of tongue in cheek because they're still there. That's the other thing that's a little weird. You know, they're actually not stolen. Stolen to me is when I can't find it. You know, in this case, they're copied. They're just now being misused, but they're still actually here. So that's kind of a weird nuance in this world. But that's what we used to talk about. The one that really, really resonates now is imagine being a company where both data centers, the one that you use normally in the backup data center, are down for three months. Three months. That's how serious it's gotten in the last year. Now imagine you not having your own information, your own iPhone, your own computer, your own laptop, your own iPad, your own Google Docs storage facility, whatever it is you depend on. Imagine not having that for three months. That's a, that's a quarter or a half of your semester not having the very thing you need the most in order to be successful, which is the information and the systems and the services. So you've hit a nice little crossroads. Need, which doesn't have enough people, True, real, deep thinking, creative minds that have got to solve problems we haven't solved and a topic that's gotten so serious that whole countries care about it. And of course, CEOs do as well. You have a better shot at enjoying a fruitful career than I did. And because, in no small part because of Michelle, I'm enjoying a pretty good career. So that's a pretty good set of setups for freshmen and it's not so bad for seniors, and it gets into the next question, which is what if you're not in the computer science field? It absolutely does not matter. My first uh, manager at Cisco actually was a biologist. Are you a biologist too? Guy by the name of Keith Redfield. He studied saltwater fish and the growth of plankton on coral reefs. 
the first CTO of the, the chief technology officer of the security business, the products that we build, was an anthropologist. Um, his name was Bob Glykoff. Neither one of those came from computer security fields, both of which had managed to steep themselves in computer security. It's not just a comp sci thing. And this gets a little bit to that next question, or at least one of the questions, which is what do we look for? Well, you're going to find a lot of different answers to that, but one of the other things that I'm going to just shamelessly embarrass Michelle all the entire time I'm here is Michelle actually talks and has taught classes on interviewing for people joining this field, how to get the best candidates, what's the interview technique by which to do it. And you'll find various aspects of this, but one of the most important things that you can do for yourself during an interview, no matter what type or situation you face, is go, you know, I don't know the answer to this question, but I know how to find out, assuming you do. And if you don't know how to find out, you can say, I don't know the answer to that question, <laughs> I'd like to research, and by the way, even after you walk out, answer it. Go back to the person that asked in the interview and answer it after you've left the interview if you couldn't come up with the answer. If you try and make it up, one of the things in security that frankly a lot of us sniff out is we figure out who's making it up. It's kind of part of the DNA of the, the types of people that you're going to work with in this field is we've got and is anybody going to be totally offended if I swear once in a while? Because I'm a New, I'm a New York. Yeah, Michelle might be, I, but she's, she's tried to beat it out of me, but she hasn't been totally good. So. Let me just say we have a BS meter that's pretty good. I'll leave it that. You can interpret what the two letters meant. The second kind of aspect of the passion in this, in this industry is curiosity. This is something that you need to have a lot of curiosity in. You can't just follow a pattern and say, okay, if A, then B, then C. You have to open up your mind to the exact reverse of what makes sense and then make sure that it still makes sense after you're done. Why do I say that? Um, so we have a data system that we run at Cisco that's 1.2 petabytes of information. And there's an endless number of questions you can ask this system to learn something. The curious person says, okay, I don't even know what I want to ask, so I'm just going to ask randomly strange questions. And believe it or not, in the security world, that can lead to the best answers. The other part about it is that we've got some problems that we don't have answers to. If we had them, you wouldn't see $600 billion of the U.S. economy being pulled out of the U.S. economy every single year by intellectual property theft as just one example. You wouldn't see the situation we face by connecting Samsung refrigerators that as soon as they got connected were then in fact used as botnet systems that were sending email to various people to see if they would actually click on and then buy some sort of aphrodisiac drug. Maybe some of you bought that, but don't admit that during the interview. Um, what, you're, what, what I'm pointing out is we're creating some of the problems we don't have great answers for which gets me into another point about the world that we find ourselves in, which is this, the IT job classification groups of the future, the areas by which we need help. And there's a whole smattering of them. You can see them in various IT worlds, but it's in the upper left-hand corner, and this is something that you're going to appreciate if you're in engineering. The upper left-hand corner says cybersecurity engineer. Here's what the computer security field is not yet. It's not an engineering discipline yet, especially cyber. The reason I say that is because there are no blueprints, there's no architectural definition that is being taught in schools that can be leveraged. I can absolutely assure you this. If this building had been built by 10 cybersecurity engineers that got together, there's a high probability it would fall down before I'm done. And it's because we're all learning just as much as anyone else is. There's no 100 years of experience in this. There's barely 20 years of experience. In fact, there's potentially less experience than even how old you all are, or if it is just within a couple of years. So there hasn't been a great deal of ability to define the right and the wrong and the structured way to do things. So we are constantly inventing new answers 
for constantly invented new problems. That's why curiosity becomes such an important aspect of the quality that you have to have to be really good in the job. Now, there's an underpinning to every job. I've always said this, which is passion. In fact, we were talking about it just about 30 minutes ago. You have to love this field. It's going to kick you around a bunch. It's hard. It's like playing any sport or any game and then losing a whole ton of the time and then having to start over and go, OK, how is that going to work for me? So if you want to be the hero all the time, you're not going to be the hero all the time. You're going to have to take a couple of lumps, and you're going to have to admire the art of what another person was successfully able to do that you couldn't figure out before they did it, and then take all that passion and go, OK, you got me this time. Now I'm going to make sure you can't get me twice and learn. There's a lot of lumps. I've got a lot of scars, and I used to have a lot more hair, and it definitely wasn't as gray when I started this stuff. And it's a humbling experience. Because some of you, in that curiosity, passion-driven way that come from whatever walk of life you do, will think completely differently than I do. And the dilemma becomes, if I think a certain way and you figure that out, then you're going to figure out how to go around the way I think. And that's where this becomes an intellectual game. Anybody like sports? Anybody like football locally? Anybody used to like football? I see a Giants. Yeah, I saw the Giants cap. So, <laughs> New York Giants, mind you, not San Francisco Giants. Well, whatever sport you like, um, there's a, there's a certain aspect of this field which is is difficult because there are rules that we have to follow when we do it, and there aren't a whole heck of a lot of rules that those trying to break in have to follow at all. So part of that, guess what? That means I can figure out how you think because you're going to have to follow a certain number of rules, including you can't break the law, whereas a hacker oftentimes can. You can't break the law that you're in, say, the United States. Well, what happens if I'm in Krakow, Poland? What happens if I'm in Beijing, China? What happens if I'm in Toronto, Canada? I got a different set of laws that I get to follow than you do, but I can reach out and touch your systems because the internet is just that powerful. The reason I put that out there is because that curiosity has also got to be dealt with, and you've got to end up having the passion to go with it because you're going to have some losses. And you're going to have that humbling moment where you get to walk up to your boss, your employee, your CEO, whatever it is, and go, they beat us. They got the information. They knocked the system over. Whatever. There are going to be those days. And there are going to be some days, for, for those of you who continue in the field, where there's going to be a really important person in your life who's going to walk up and go, are we safe? And you're going to have to say, nope. <laughs> Imagine staring down your CEO and say, are, you know, are we secure? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? So you've got to have that passion because you're also going to have to be like your only, the only person on the inside that's passionate about this topic. You're going to have to go up against people that are just praying to God you're right, but also might be like not looking forward to the answer that you're about to give them. Um, because it's it becomes sort of a bad news story sometimes. Yeah, guess what? We got hit. Yeah, guess what? They took the information. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, but we'll make sure to do better next time. It's a hard field, but it's a lot of fun, and 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 you can tell that hopefully from the way I'm talking to you. Because what I'm what I'm telling you is that it's so intellectually challenging. And I'll give you an example of how it can become really intellectually challenging in a really quick hurry. So within five years, by all projections, and we might actually be, have undershot the number at Cisco, there'll be 50 billion devices on the internet. Now, there are about 7.6 billion people on the face of Earth. And you ask yourself, all right, so where's all the other devices going? Well, number one, you've probably got two, three, or 10 of them, depending on who you are. You, and, I, and you're going to laugh, but you might have two of them with you now. But then think of anything you've got at your house. It's probably got an IP address. It might be a television. It might be a gaming system. It might be who knows what. It might be the, the touch panel. It might be your lights. I mean, there's, there, I mean when, when I saw the app on the light that you could actually change the color of the light based on whatever you snapped as a picture, 
I began to realize that we're taking technology to a totally new place, which is you're going to have anything you can think of being connected. And then when I saw the fact that somebody, any, anybody, well, <laughs> hopefully not. Anybody have kids? OK, many? Just one, okay. So hopefully not a lot of you yet, but if you do, whatever it is, there are diapers that have IP addresses now. No, I'm not exaggerating. Um, there's an app that works on an iPhone that'll tell you whether or not the baby needs changing. So you're all laughing now, but I bet you you're gonna use them when you ever decide to have kids. So that's another set of devices I didn't see coming online, right? It's not like I woke up one day and said, guess what we're gonna do? But that's online. There's a whole set of trees in the Brazilian rainforest where they use drones and go right over them, they all have IP addresses. And the reason they have IP addresses, they're trying to study global warming and deforestation in Brazil. And they have IP addresses. Where are they getting the energy? Turns out trees, because they're actually producing things like heat and everything else, can self-generate a certain amount of electrical energy that a sensor put right on it can in fact generate and shoot information up to a drone that goes ripping right across it. That's a set of IP addresses. Hmm, that's a little different. Not like I actually woke up and said, I'm going to have to go mano a mano with a hacking group of trees. But those are the kinds of things you're being connected online. There's a house up in San Francisco that tweets. If you haven't seen this, you should look it up. It, now, why in the world anybody thought this was a good idea, I don't know. But it tweets. It tweets, it's too hot. It tweets, I just put the shades down because the sun's out. It tweets, well, I'm too cold, so I actually turned on the heat. And the whole thing is online all day long. Didn't see that one coming either. And I can give you a list, a list, a list, but let me give you this last thought, which is there's a herd of cows in uh, Sweden, no, sorry, Norway, that are IP addressable. And they're IP addressable because the farmer's trying to track their movements, trying to make sure if any of them are sick. That's where 50 billion comes from. Things are being put online all the time. There's a set of sensors all throughout Japan for the Yukushima plant that uh, essentially was destroyed and ir uh, irradiated a whole area of Japan. They're studying for 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe even 100 years the effects of long-term radiation exposure from an event like that. That's where these devices come from. Now, ans answer me this. How is security going to be applied to that problem? How do you take 50 billion things and make them safe from one another, make them safe against the attacks that might come at them, and make all of us safe from the attacks that might come from them. So when I say we're going to leave a few things that we haven't got solved behind when all of us decide to retire, the thing that I worry about is I'm going to be in a wheelchair that's got an IP address and one of you has not managed to solve the problem. I'd kind of like for you to solve the problem before the wireless connection on my, on my uh, wheelchair shoots me straight out the door straight into traffic and I get run over by an automated Google car. So, <laughs> so there are a lot of challenges we haven't managed to figure our way out of yet and we're going to need the help because we need different thinking. I was brought up a certain way, you're growing in a different way, you're learning in a different way, diversity matters. And that's another aspect of this field, the reason an anthropologist and a biologist can get into it is because the anthropological type says, you know what, how did human being and species survive? Diversity mattered, resiliency mattered, Darwinistic behavior mattered, strength in DNA mattered. This is all a cybersecurity conversation in a totally different field. How do biological ecosystems survive, live, or die? Typically the same way. There's a certain amount of ingredients that make them survive. There's a certain amount of parasites that ensure that the good things live and the bad things die. All of that is a cybersecurity conversation, except we're talking about it in a different domain. Two of the people I listen to the most are my, my two older sisters. Don't tell them I said that. This is on video, isn't it? All right, don't clip that video and let my sister see that one. So, my eldest sister, Jane, uh, runs, a medical pra runs one of the largest medical practices in New York. Total medicine, totally talks about the way they deal with triaging and dealing with patients and how they actually have the golden hour between injury and, and, uh, and successful, um, successful treatment, how they deal with critically uh, and terminal ill patients versus diagnosed patients, emergency room versus you know, local doctor. Guess what cybersecurity is? I need to find out the most infected computer, what's the damage, if it's gonna infect anybody else, I have to quarantine it, I've gotta diagnose it, I've actually gotta fix it, I've gotta triage it, then I've gotta forensically analyze what happened. Same conversation. My other sister is a PhD immunologist out of Stanford, in case you can't tell, she's the brains of the family. Um, and she talks about human genome sequencing, and the whole reason they're trying to do that is to figure out where illnesses can be detected by sampling blood. 
What am I trying to do? I'm trying to figure out where viruses are on a computer. Same situation. You walk every single file on the computer, you walk every single element of the computer, you figure out what's infected, what's not. It's the same conversation, different field. So diverse thinking can help. By the way, isn't it great that iPhones actually survive falls? Because that's two. <laughs> um, so we are going to create a couple of problems we can't actually solve. And we need your thinking because you're not predisposed to the cynical thinking that we're probably predisposed to. You actually are seeing it in a different light. You're seeing it in a different way. You're seeing how to fix it, not the problem. You're looking for the answer. And the innovation, the curiosity, and the passion that I just described are elemental. Now, to give you a sense of how long this has been going on, and I'll just cover essentially the last couple of years and where it's going here, is this one. The hard part for me, being in this field now, is that countries are attacking other countries, including the US, by the way, um, are attacking other countries. And it's in the same space that companies exist. So there's a technology issue that I'm talking about mostly, but now there's a political and political science, social, psychological, you name it issue, which is how do countries and people coexist in a place where we all think very differently and yet we can reach out and touch one another. It's a very strange thought. So the hard part you know, that I think you all should take in, into account is that as you look at some issue that you read, it's entirely possible that the other person on the other side of that issue is going, that's the right thing to do. And you're going, that's the wrong thing. But yet you're now interacting together. So you got to get back into the mind of those that are on the other side. And when I say curious, I mean not just about technology, I mean about people. Why are they motivated to do what they do? I met two twins in Eastern Europe. They were 16. And they were hackers. And they were very good, by the way. And they did it for money, no doubt. They were part of an electronic crime ring that was working out of Russia. They ended up developing some of the software out of Eastern Europe. That's who they were. And I thought to myself, why in the world is this a good job for you? And they said, it's the only job available. And all I'm trying to do is put food on the table and feed the fact that my dad left, my mom essentially is sick, and my grandmother's living with us. And that's what the twins told me. Very pragmatic answer. They weren't trying to do it because they were trying to break in and steal credit cards from all of you. They were trying to be employed to put food on their table. Yet from my perspective, going into that conversation, I was like, gosh, these people are wrong. This is, I mean, you're stealing money from other people. And then you twist it a little bit and go, well, all right, maybe they're not as wrong as I thought they were because they don't have an alternative, different way of life. So think about the other side because as you're up against these people that are trying to break into your systems or you're trying to figure out, you also have to remember they may not think like you do. And that means you got to remember how they're thinking. All right. I'm not going you know, I'll, I'll leave this behind just so you guys get it. But there's essentially a set of issues that are, this is being used for. Um, that breaking into systems or manipulating data or attacking other countries is all about. Um, and it's not all simple, but essentially it's about money, it's about power. It's about influence or it's about destruction. It's the only four that matter. Power, money, influence, destruction. It's the only four that matter. Keep those in the back of your head because then you have to figure out why is it somebody's trying to break into your server? You might want to know. Here's what this looks like at a $40 billion company level. Anybody got 40 extra billion dollars? Okay, well you could have bought us if you did. Um, so we've got a seven days a week, 24 hour shop. 73,000 employees, 108 different countries. I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. <clears throat> and we have a brand. We have a place we want you to work. We want to make it interesting. We want to make it exciting. And we have built the equipment that runs and powers the internet today. So pretty significant that some of the events that I just described to you that cybersecurity professionals have to worry about, Cisco helped make this mess. So we take it pretty personally that some of this mess is actually something we helped. We didn't intend to, but we did. Now we're trying to figure out how to solve it. The second part of it is, what are the impacts? Turns out, our customers routinely now are coming to us saying, hey, look, I'm really worried about this, the whole security thing. I told you that a minute ago at that CEO summit. You have to help me fix it. And that gets a whole other example of how to be really cool in this industry. When you know how to fix these problems, you can go help people fix them. I've had conversations with at least two of you here just in the last hour and a half, hour, hour and a half, that you talked about wanting to help other people, 
or pass along what you do and how to help it 10, 200, or 2,000 people. Frankly, it's another way to do it. You can become a consultant that helps our customers. You're taking your knowledge and helping somebody else fix their problems. Very rewarding, by the way, to actually be able to help other people. So that's the kind of impact that we actually get out of this. And to give you a sense of this from scale, this will give you a sense, and I apologize that the colors might be a little bit tough, um, but we've acquired 173 companies. We have 275,000 hosts. We've got the better part of 500 providers of application service that we use in the business. And as you can see, we're transmitting or transiting about 32 terabytes of traffic per day. Now here's the question. 32 terabytes of traffic a day. So that's a lot. Now try and find a hacker in the middle of 32 terabytes of traffic a day. Every day. It's a scale problem. It's a complicated thing. It takes kind of unique thinking and we don't always catch them. But we're pretty good, but we don't always catch them. Now, eventually, some of us are gonna go do margarita bars over in an island somewhere. When we actually leave, we're gonna need people that are ready to go and understand how the internet works. And by the way, this is one of the things I want you all to be able to know. How does DNS work? How does TCP IP work? How does routing work? How does switching work? How do hosts work? How do stacks work? Get the basics of the way the internet operates. We had to learn it because the internet was breaking all the time when we were putting it together. And so we all kind of grew up in it and we had to diagnose this stuff all the time. So we learned essentially those basics. If you make, or if you learn, including here at SGSU, if you learn only the here's how applications work, you're missing a whole segment of what you're gonna to have to understand in this industry. If you don't know what DNS is, figure out what DNS is. If you don't know what routing tables are like, figure out what those are looking like. If you don't know how to use command line, figure out command line. You're gonna want all of it in this space. I bring that up because in order to figure out some of these problems, what you also have to know is that that dearth of talent, the people we can't find, one of the ways to be better in the interview, which is one of the questions, what am I looking for talent, how do I actually diagnose it and during this, is if you don't understand the basic building blocks of something, you're not gonna be able to help us completely on the upper bounds of the stuff. But if you're curious and you're passionate, you'll install your own operating system, you'll take a Linux instance and put it on a server, you'll reload, reboot, or restructure your phone, you'll upgrade Android, break it, and then have to go back and get it fixed. I mean, you'll do all sorts of things that are gonna go wrong, but you're gonna learn and you're gonna fix them and you're gonna learn exactly how it works. And when you know that stuff, you have diagnostic skills. And that's another aspect of what we look for. How do you think through a problem? Not that you're gonna to get to the right answer every time, but that how do you think about the problem? Curiosity comes in, passion comes in, and ultimately, you understand the building blocks of how these things work. It's essentially like saying, hey, if you're actually, if you're gonna be in car, um, car maintenance, if you don't understand how tires and axles work, or an engine works, you can't do the job right. You can do a certain amount of the job because you can plug the thing into a computer and it'll tell you it's wrong. Hmm, not what we're looking for. We're looking for people that actually are creative in research and understand problems, okay? Let me close with these. Notice this? That's the other aspect. That curiosity should come with an insatiable, insatiable appetite to learn stuff. Just insatiable. I had to learn a whole bunch of stuff about the law, and I was a computer science grad. I had never, I never thought I was ever gonna spend time with lawyers. And thankfully, for good reasons, I'm spending time with lawyers. If there's bad reasons, I might be having a different career and I might be talking to you about how to stay out of jail, but that's not, thankfully, what I have to do. But I didn't understand the law, and I didn't realize how important it becomes in trying to arrest people and how limiting it is that the law, in fact, doesn't allow for prosecuting criminals that do this, and international law. And by the way, when things happen in politics in the world, it turns out cyber attacks happen as a side effect. I'll tell you right now, when the U.S. pisses off some part of the world, cyber attacks go up, usually from the other part of the world that we've annoyed as a country. China does the same thing, same situation. Toronto, same situation. The Netherlands, Syria, Australia, New Zealand, I mean, you name it. It's become a way by which to express frustration at a country or a company in a country or at an individual. 
So you got to be insatiable in the knowledge. You got to be able to just read. You got to study and find out what's happened the latest and understand it in depth. That's insatiable learning, and that's another aspect of what we look for: is that you don't walk away just accepting that you don't know the answer. You actually want to know. You want to know why. You want to know what. And in fact, in some cases, you have to just reach out and ask somebody because you haven't any idea because it's a totally different field. Now, this is a general comment. Find your own niche. Find the thing you love. Cybersecurity's got a lot of different fields. Some people want to be forensics investigators and they want to show up and go, I'm going to figure out how you got hit and what the software did. Other people are going to, you're going to want to walk in and go, nah, I want to run router switches, firewalls, and I want to protect against the bad guys. Whole different group of people are going to want to go in and say, I think I actually want to be an architect and help design the policy and the systems by which to defend this company, but not really run them so I get woken up in the middle of the night. Different group of people <laughs> just want to write policy. I want to write the rules. I want to tell everybody what to do. Then you're going to have to discover that about 90% of them probably won't listen to you, but don't worry about that part. <laughs> How many of you bro have already broken the rules at SGSU on the use of usable computing policy? I'm sure there's a couple, right? Because that's just the way it, it, it is kind of like human nature. But find your niche. Find the area that you actually like the most, and then go after it just relentlessly. And then on the top, really, truly understand the market. Understand the security market. There are things that we have made mistakes on that you're going to have to fix. There are things that we have still got problems with that we need solutions for you. You've got to solve. And ultimately, in the end, the good news about this market is you're all gainfully employable. If you really get that passion, you really get that curiosity, and in the end, you end up passing that all in during the interview. And you say, remember, if you don't know the answer to your question, I don't know. I'll stop talking. You can start asking questions. If you don't ask questions for the next couple of minutes, I warn you right now, I'll start asking you questions. And that means I can sit next to anybody and ask them a question. Uh, and by the way, I can ask you anything about, answer anything about my career. There's no topic off the table. Being a New York lover, you can appreciate growing up in upstate New York means you really can't insult me unless you insult my mom or my kids. My wife insults me all the time, so I'm not worried about that. You, of course, it's on video. Dang it. Where do you live at, John? Where do I live? Yeah. I live up in uh, the East Bay, kind of Concord Walnut Creek area, so I've got a bit of a hike. Yep. Um, I, uh, I was certainly born and raised in upstate New York. I came out here in 1992. Um, and, uh, and frankly, part of the reason I came out in 1992, for those of you who know New York and you're in upstate in January, I can promise you January in 1992 or January, frankly, of any year, you're freezing yeah. and it's snowy. And then you show up in California to the weather. It's just like the weather that's outside now. And frankly, I was begging Michelle for the job, and I didn't care if she said, well, you're just going to have to sweep. I was like, well, I just want to get out of the snow. <laughs> Sir? Uh, so what did you start with uh, to learn uh, uh, and enter the security field? But where did you start? Which guys did you meet? So I got a little lucky on two fronts. Um, the first was, and I was, I was telling this story earlier, so I didn't grow up with a lot of money. Um, in upstate New York. We weren't, we weren't poor, poor, but we weren't by any means you know, well off rich and could do this kind of stuff. When, um, when I saw a couple computer games um, on, of all things, Apple IIEs, so this is going back to the days of which you know, you'll never have to experience. Um, and I liked them so much, but I didn't have any money. I figured out how to break the software licensing codes by binary editing the games and broke them and then illegally copied them and then essentially stole software. Look, I was underage. And there's a statute of limitations long ago where I can't be prosecuted for that anymore. Um, but no, I mean that in the lucky sense, which was it gave me the intense curiosity to figure out how to do things and that helped. Um, you have to learn how to break things to protect them in my opinion. And in your world, you have to do it in a safer domain than we had to, because we used to break into each other's computers all the time. Once we got on the internet, we're not allowed to really do that as much anymore. We play capture the flag. And this is the second, um, uh, the second step uh, where I got a little lucky, which was I was at Syracuse University in 1988. And in the history of the computer security world, that's when the Robert Morris Worm Jr. Uh, worm attacked the internet. It was launched out of Cornell. And for those of you who know New York, that's exactly south of Syracuse, about two and a half hours. And in the internet world, the next hop on the internet of 1992 
Syracuse University. That's where I was. I was in the computing center when all sorts of computers started going down. And I got to watch Don McLeod, John Vogtel, and a series of my mentors in this field all work it and then ask me to be a part of it. And then I got hooked. Um, and then all of a sudden it became interesting. I became this, sort of the security administrator for Syracuse University because there was no field. I didn't know what I was doing either half the time. Um, but I was learning and I began to meet people like Dan Farmer. I met Michelle. I met Witsy Venema. I met industry legacy you know, leaders of this space that were learning too. And I was starting to ask questions and learn and run software. But curiosity became passion. And then passion turned into ultimate, you know, the field that I fell in love with. So I got a little lucky. I can't, I can't argue it. Did you ever write an exploit or anything? I did actually, um, though I did it. Uh, <laughs> all right. So here's another thing where statute of limitations matters. So I was in, um, I was in my junior year of, uh, of computer science and woefully behind on an assignment. Um, that was going to count for some, I don't remember, it was like 30, 35% of my grade. And so it was an upper class, uh, you know, junior class um, uh, assignment. And it struck me that um, I was never going to get it done in time and then it was going to be a really hard, hard, hard day next day. But one of the things I, I started asking questions about was, well, what happens if I could fill up the entire disk of the computing system that I was on, at which point I wouldn't be able to save the file at which point I could say, look, I tried, but you know, they, it couldn't save it on the disk. It's a disk full, and therefore the teacher couldn't, professor couldn't hold me accountable. I was like, look, the system broke. What I didn't realize at the time, because I then wrote a script that would fill up the entire hard drive of the computing system that was in the data center, was there was actually a bug in the disk drivers, and so the systems crashed. Um, which was fine, actually, because the same result, right? You know, right? <laughs> but it just wasn't something I had expected. <laughs> so it was an exploit, I guess, but somewhat by accident. But eh, I did it. Maybe I won't, I won't kid you. Next question. Could you wait until he gives you the mic so we can get you on the uh, recording? Did I answer the three questions that, that you all asked? Because it was like, how do I get inside of a field? What are you looking for for talent? How do we actually do interviewing? What are the skills? Did I hit all that? Sir. Well, now that we're starting to see more wireless attacks happening, uh, how do we go ahead and possibly mitigate those attacks for future occurrences? It's a great question. Um, you're going to live more in a wireless world than a wired world, uh, at least my bet. In fact, you probably already do. Um, you know, to a certain degree, I would tell you the same basic rules apply. Um, how do you lower the chances of it happening? Well, maybe you actually embed the security in the wireless network versus on the devices connecting to the wireless network. Um, that's basically the way firewalls used to work for end computing systems. Um, the second one is uh, how do you use computers together on a wireless network to help cooperate to defeat an attack against one of them? Um, think about you as a group of people. If you see somebody getting hurt, a whole group of people could stop it together. Um, now, we haven't solved these problems this way yet, but I'm trying to give you a couple of just interesting ideas to maybe noodle on to go, all right, well, that's just a different way of thinking about it, and might that work? Um, but I'll, I'll flip the question back to you, which is, since your world's going to be more wireless than wired, and mine was more wired than wireless, I actually think some of the answers are going to come out of you guys, um, which is, you know, maybe wireless has to be redesigned in a way that actually doesn't allow some of the things that we're actually seeing today, um, just flat out doesn't allow it. Um, or maybe the, um, the, the way that the wireless network works, it stops or disrupts any attack that it sees, but still figures out a way to, say, choose another network dynamically because the wireless network you're connecting to for your cell tower is the attack. And so your phone goes, never mind, I'm getting off that network and it joins you know, the wireless network at Starbucks. And it gets out of the way. You know, so I don't know. Um, but my hope is you're going to innovate answers because we kind of, as I might have mentioned, are leaving a few problems behind that we haven't completely fixed yet. Sir. I have two questions. One, 
is a bit viral. I asked Michelle about it. It's your virtual internet routing lab. You mentioned about learning about the seven layers. I think that's an outstanding way to learn. Um, I already asked Michelle and I asked you, is there any way you can find out which department has it and can we get some donations in that area because as students it's kind of hard. Number two, what hacking lab or CTF lab does Cisco have? Because we're, we're looking to try to get a job at Cisco. So there's, there's a couple answers to that question. Um, and in fact, uh, wherever you went, um, uh, the two things. Number one, um, do we have an ability to actually get you, you know, time material systems capacity playground, if you will, on how to break things? Um, I think the answer is yes. The, the part I don't have the answer to is the process. But I know between Michelle's passion, certainly, um, and my own for enabling college students and, and getting next generation. There is a way, I've watched it happen before. We've helped other colleges um, that were building up programs, uh, both small and big, um, to experiment on our own infrastructure and, and the systems that we run in our labs. So we'll figure out a way is basically where I'm going. Um, which brings me to the second point, which is we have what's called the cyber range, which essentially is the way by which you can play safely in an offense defense kind of world to hack and hack back. Um, and I, I'll come up, I'll, I'll talk to the team that's running, it's actually out of Australia, interestingly enough, and get a, a question back to them going, how are we working with universities to allow students to play on the range? Because it's a fairly popular place. Um, we've got whole countries and offense defense teams that are testing uh, for enterprise companies that are training. Um, and then the last that uh, uh, Calvin hit me up on the way in, was um, we also, I know, work with SJSU already and can continue to work with students on getting you into the classes that we teach. Um, and that's usually the Cisco Networking Academy. Um, I've watched us you know, bring students, invite students, have selection of students, you know, how you as professors or, or you as students end up applying, et cetera. I just don't have the process neatly in my head. Um, so I, I'm good as my word, so I'll get back to and coordinate with Michelle and Calvin so you've actually got it. I want to add, uh, Ruben and I is from a college called Mount San, Diego, Mount San Antonio Community College. We do a lot of hiking events, and Calvin has been so instrumental last year. He talked about the hope of collaborating with community colleges so that we can have a specific specific area to come. Down in Southern California, we can go to Cal State Fullerton, Dominguez Hills, and uh, Cal Poly. And just so happen, our specialty is cybersecurity. We end up getting the business of science major. Right. So I was talking to Professor Austin today, and hopefully we will be able to come from that community college to here, because our professor, everything Cisco, and what we found, we started a business in the last, uh, last semester. And so what we found out is our customers, when we go into their place of business, we remove everything and put Cisco because that's what we're learning. So that's why we made the trip out here. And, and we, it's exactly what we want you to be successful is so that you actually have your students get employed that ultimately go, you know what, you don't need any of this stuff. The Cisco stuff actually works great. That's actually part of the reason I'm here is because I want you to know our company, and of course that's what exactly what we want as a business, not only for ourselves, you know, for just to have the professionals, but because we know for a fact, and that's why Cisco Networking Academy was put together in the outreach programs um, to universities, is exactly what you just said, which is the more you know us, and then you understand our technology, the more likely it is that you'll want to use it later on in life in full-time employment. Um, so when I said I'll get back to you, I'm not kidding around. It's a very self-serving interest. I want more people to know what we do and how we do it and use it because that turns into purchasing power later on, which turns into customers, which all going well means our stock price goes up. You know, those little things are very selfishly oriented, but I, I'm not kidding aside. That's why I'll actually make sure to follow up with, uh, with Calvin for sure. And we'll eventually become Cisco partners. Good. And keep growing. Good. Thanks for the two questions. I'm going to have to scoot, so I'll take one last one if there is one, or I will do what I promised I would do. And I'm going to put this off, so forgive me if this actually makes noise on your uh, audio system.
because I think it's only fair that the very first question that I was asked, I fulfilled before I did. <laughs> and since I'm not going to be sweating for too much longer, I'll make sure to put this on. Thanks for that question, bud. <laughs> Before everybody leaves, um, what were you doing at 15? Were you sitting in a college class? <laughs> were you yeah, sitting in a college well. class? I want to recognize two brothers, 15 and 17, that came here to meet you to learn about cybersecurity. Who? Do it. Could you stand so everybody can recognize you? <laughs> and their uncle. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Any more questions? This is the wrong. Mm -hmm. I've heard about you already. <laughs> really? Uh, Just <laughs> so you mentioned policy. Yeah. What can you tell me about that? Get this back. Just gonna pass with these guys. Uh, policy, in the sense of uh, it's two things really. So there's whole national law, legal policy, um, a whole bunch of things that haven't been written down yet. Uh, that we need rules for at a, at a country level, at an international level, uh, you name it. That's one portion of policy I can tell you that needs a lot of help. Um, I actually, when I was joking about the lawyers a minute ago, the other group I didn't know I was going to spend so much time with is political leadership um, of both our country as, as well as other countries. Turns out if you can translate this space to like how do you write laws and how do you write national agendas, that's not easy, um, especially when you're talking to people that don't understand this space at all. So that's part one. There's part two, though, which is how do you write policies for companies? What's good, what's bad, what's allowed, what isn't? And if you really, really uh, enjoy the field, how do you turn that into technology that enforces policies? And that's, a, that's a secondary aspect of that second category, and that's what I meant about policy. It's, it's both parts, the political side of it, the legal side of it, as well as the, uh, the actual writing for a company and then potentially even creating technology that enforces it. Thanks for the question. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. My time is now officially expired. I'm sure yours has as well. Um, the good news for you is I think there's more pizza and we don't need to bring it back with us. Um, the second thing that I would like to just really, really say is it's a privilege for me to be here. And I appreciate both Calvin being as passionate as he was Michelle, Michelle, who's moved um, for being as passionate as she was in to get me involved. If you don't and have not met Michelle, you need to know her. She is an amazing, amazing person. Um, and she's the kind of person that will know you for a long time and help you through your life in various walks of it. So get to know her. Um, and then clearly, I would like to thank you, Calvin, for just being as passionate about this topic to invite me in, and then for all of you to take time out of your busy day. Sir. Just a quick note. So I'm um, currently an operations manager at Cisco. Came to see this wonderful gentleman talk. Um, he doesn't know who I am, of course. But um, if, you, if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about opportunities at Cisco, I'm available to speak after. He's on. It's, it was kind of funny when I saw you all sitting there. I was like, oh, we got Cisco, more Cisco faces here. <laughs> so obviously we're here to stay. <laughs> Seriously, thanks a lot for coming out. I appreciate it. It's good to meet all of you. I appreciate it.